Hello, it's Dr. Khan with chapter 19.1 to 19.3. Here are the learning objectives for these sections. Air masses are defined as large bodies of air. An air mass is considered one air mass because it has similar temperature at different altitudes and similar moisture content at any given altitude. Air masses affect a large region or portion of the continent, and because they have similar characteristics and notably different characteristics from other air masses, that causes some interactions between the air masses that lead to some predictable weather patterns. An air mass is going to get its characteristics based on where it forms. That's an important idea. So an air mass that forms over continental Canada is going to be cold, but it's also going to be dry. And the way that we know that is that it's forming over land instead of having formed over water. So any air mass forming over land is gonna be considered dry, but because this one is also located in Canada, it's cold as well. Air masses can move and do move. So an air mass will move from its source region into another area. So the source region, again, where it acquires its uh, characteristics. And if it's uh, very cold, we consider it polar and it gets this designation of P, T for tropical. These are low latitude, warm areas. Remember low latitude zero being the equator. The continental lowercase c versus the lowercase m talks about where it formed in terms of how much moisture is going to be expected to be in the air mass. So air masses that formed over a continent will get that designation lowercase c for continental and maritime lowercase m. So we put these uh, letters together in order to give us our four basic types of air masses. Continental polar, that tells me it's dry and cold. Continental tropical tells me that it's dry but warm. Maritime polar tells me it's moist or uh, humid air, but it's cold. And maritime tropical tells me that it's humid and warm. We take a look at the source regions that are important for areas around North America, our dominant types of air masses that interact in order to give us the weather that we're familiar with here locally. If we look at where we are, we have this winter pattern uh, where we're dominated by this continental polar air. That makes sense for our winters. And this cold, dry air is pushing hard against this maritime tropical, this warm, humid air that never quite, it doesn't typically, I should say, make it very far north. Although we've seen exceptions notably in the past few years uh, where we do have warm weather that comes from the south, even during the winter, oftentimes melting snow. During the winter, which we used to in this area not see happen, we would get snow and we'd have snow on the ground for the entire winter but that's changing as the climate warms and then the dominant summer pattern is that we have this actual actually this line that oftentimes ends up right where we are this boundary between this continental polar dry air and the maritime tropical wet air and it's this boundary of interaction that gives us things like thunderstorms and possibly even tornadoes we get a lot of um, our interesting weather patterns coming from the interplay between these two specific continental polar and maritime tropical air masses. And this is what it says here again, and you'll be asked this question as well. These are the two most dominant air masses east of the Rockies. We have our cold, dry air versus our humid, warm air. The continental polar air mass um, when it crosses the Great Lakes, it does pick up moisture from the lakes, and that's what gives us lake effect snow, if you've heard of that before. Uh, lake effect snows, really dry air is blowing over the lakes, picking up moisture, and then dumping snow on the leeward shores. So leeward being opposite from windward. And we see this happening here. We have Lake Superior, so cold Canadian air, and it's a dry air mass picking up moisture as it crosses over Lake Superior and dumping snow along this leeward side. So this would call the windward side over here and the leeward side 
on the southern and eastern shore of Lake Superior. The maritime tropical comes from the Gulf of Mexico and to some extent the Atlantic Ocean. It's warm air and it brings precipitation to the eastern United States. There's also the continental tropical, which is the southwestern dry hot air. This is obviously important regionally to the southwest, but again, because uh, east of the Rockies is dominated by those two north and south type air masses, we don't really see a lot of interplay between the continental tropical and the other air masses. And maritime polar, we'll see this a little bit when we talk about uh, one of the common weather setups in the United States, but maritime polar, so let's break that down for a minute. This is humid air, but coming from a cold source region. So this is coming cold air coming off of the northern Atlantic and then blowing on shore in the northeast of the United States. So this is what's commonly storms, <clears throat> excuse me, from these systems or that air mass are commonly called nor'easters. Air masses start out in one way with one set of characteristics, but as they move, they are modified. So continental polar air, as it moves uh, southward, is going to be modified. It's going to be cool, but not cold. It will be less dry as it travels over a body of water. And as it moves even uh, further south, it's still going to be cool, but it's going to have picked up a lot of moisture as it moves then towards the west coast of America. Fronts, section 19.2 talks about the boundary that separates different air masses. Those air masses have different densities, different temperatures, different moistures, and the air masses will retain their identities, but when they collide, something's going to happen. There's going to be some kind of interplay between those two air masses. And the important thing to remember here is that cold air is more dense than warm air. That's a very important concept for this entire chapter. Cold air is kind of like a, a plow. It's gonna plow through warm air and force it upwards. Warm air is less dense, so it's going to rise. A warm front is characterized by, actually anytime we see this something front, we're talking about what's moving in on the other front. So the warm front is moving in, this warm air is moving in on colder air. That's like the aggressor that's doing the moving in. So warm air is moving in in place of cooler air. And we have symbols on our weather map that you'll have to identify. This is a red line with semicircles. The semicircles are going to be pointing in the direction that the warm air is moving. The warm air is moved up, but it's not moved up quickly or violently or vertically. It's really moved up at a very shallow slope, so gradually. So crowd, clouds of cover will become lower as the front nears, but it's a very slow rate of advance. And we typically see light to moderate precipitation associated with warm fronts. Here we have a visualization of what happens as a warm front approaches. So again, we have the red semicircles that are facing in the direction that the warm air is moving. Warm air is moving in on colder air, but because it's less dense, it's being forced to rise. And we remember from previous chapters, as warm air rises, it's going to cool. It'll cool down to its point of condensation. That's that lifted condensation level. Clouds will begin to form. It keeps lifting. It's going to form precipitation and wring out the moisture in that warm air. So we see kind of these like sheet-like clouds Nimbo, remember, meaning rain. Stratus, meaning kind of a sheet or blanket-like cloud. This is the kind of precipitation where it's just gray all day. It's gray and raining all day. It's not really particularly heavy. It just kind of rains all day. And then as the clouds continue to move up, they continue to move up in a fashion that makes them look like a blanket or a sheet. And then at the very edge, we have this cirrostratus. So again, very high altitude, but almost blanket-like cirrus clouds. And then at the very tip here, we have cirrus clouds. So consider what that's like for somebody who's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and what their weather is going to be like as this warm air approaches. First, they'll have, in their skies, they'll have very high cirrus clouds. And as this front continues to advance, they'll have cirrostratus clouds. And as it continues to advance, they'll have altostratus. So in other words, the cloud cover, the clouds are coming lower and lower and lower until they just have this blanket kind of 
sheet of dark clouds in the sky and it's going to rain. After the front passes, warmer air is behind. So St. Louis already went through or is going through uh, this frontal passage here. Kansas City having moved, <clears throat> excuse me, through uh, this front in this series of stages. So now Kansas City is experiencing this warmer, stable air that's come in to replace it. A question you might see is like, what, what, what is the weather expected to be after a warm front passes or after a cold front passes? So know that after the warm front passes, we have warm air behind it. A cold front is when the cold air is the aggressor. It's moving in on the warmer air. We see triangles, blue triangles that are pointed in the direction that the cold air is moving. And it's very steep. The, the incline is twice as steep as warm fronts. And it also moves in a lot faster than a warm front moves. This is more violent weather compared to a warm front. Typically, the precipitation is more intense, but it's also a shorter event because the cold front moves more quickly. So whereas a warm front, it was raining all day, a cold front, you're going to have a line of severe storms that pass and then it's over. The weather that comes in behind it after it's over is cold air and clearing conditions. If we have a cold air mass coming in, we have air that's sinking because it's dense. Sinking air means clear conditions because remember you need rising air in order to make clouds. Here is a visualization of a cold air mass moving in on a warm air mass. So note first the blue triangles that are pointing in the direction that the cold air is moving. This warm air is being, again, like a, almost like a plow. This cold air is forcing that warm air up. It has nowhere else to go. And because it's forcing it up and forcing it up quite vertically, we get vertical cloud development. Remember cumulo, the cumulus kind of puffy clouds, nimbus, rain we get these vertical vertically developed clouds that are typical of our heaviest type of rainstorms or thunderstorms so we do see heavy precipitation that's associated with this warm air being forced to rise quickly cooling and condensing precipitation thunder lightning and maybe even tornadoes what does this look like Kind of out here if i'm in indianapolis there might be some cirrus clouds um cirrus clouds up high <clears throat> excuse me then <clears throat> these puffy cumulus clouds in advance of the approaching uh, vertical clouds that come with the passing of the thunderstorm a stationary front is when air is neither moving it's not moving towards each other we don't have a cold front situation where the cold air is moving in on the warm front or vice versa. They're actually moving almost parallel to each other. So not towards each other, not away from each other, but parallel. So the position of the front doesn't actually move. Let's look at that um, here. And then occluded front is when an active cold front catches up with or overtakes a warm front. We'll see this actually is better described by looking at a series of pictures. Let's break down the first picture. What we're looking at here is warm air moving in on cool air. If we just kind of cover up this half and we don't look at what's going on over here, this is a standard warm front. Warm air moving in on colder air. It's moving up a very shallow slope. We get this all day precipitation. But what's happening behind it is this cold air mass, this different cold air mass is moving in on the warm air that's sitting here. And what's going to happen since the cold front is moving more quickly than the warm air is moving, it's going to end up squeezing or pinching this warm air up and out until the cold air eventually has caught up with that cooler air that was associated with the warm front. Most of our uh, interesting weather and <clears throat> excuse me, in this uh, part of the, of the world is from what are called mid-latitude cyclones. A mid-latitude cyclone is a storm system. So think about cyclone is rotating counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. These are storms. So life cycle, they form where air masses are moving parallel to the front, but in opposite directions. So we'll see what that looks like here. <clears throat> 
we have our tropical warm wet air that's moving north from the Gulf of Mexico and we have our cold air that's moving south from Canada and so that's going to create a couple of different interactions. We're going to throw in now a third air mass that maritime um, air that's very that's very cold here this polar maritime air it's going to be moist but it's going to be um, relatively cold. So when these three come together around a low they start to circulate and they form these boundaries or interactions that are typical of a mid-latitude cyclone. So let's start at the low. We have this cold Canadian air meeting up with and moving in on this warm air that's wet and warm, so we have a cold front. This warm wet air is catching up with cooler air coming off of the Atlantic Ocean. We have a warm air that's the aggressor, that's the warm front. And we have this cooler air moving in on this colder air. And we have essentially here, I think of this as like the top of a zipper of what's gonna happen here. Because if you remember, this colder air is moving faster than the warmer air. So eventually this triangle is going to catch up with this area. And that triangle is eventually gonna catch up with this area. And this is going to zip up as kind of an occluded front. So we have a cold front catching up with a warm front. That's our definition of an occluded front. Down here we see that's what's happening. Our colder air is moving in on the warm air. That's our cold front. And then our warm front is the warm air catching up with the cooler air mass. And eventually those will zip up uh, to form an occluded front. So this whole rotating interaction between these three air masses is what's called a mid-latitude cyclone. Here are the steps for the formation or life cycle of the mid-latitude cyclone. There are some predictable weather patterns that we can anticipate associated with the fronts of a mid-latitude cyclone. So I'll back up a minute just to look at that. Again, if we have a warm front, that means we have that kind of gray rain all day, cold front, thunderstorm development possible. And if I'm at uh, Position A, I would have seen that passage of the cold front, the thunderstorms with cold air coming in to replace it. And we've seen this, if you've looked at a weather map, when we have severe weather that's moving through or across the country, typically we see a lot of tornado activity kind of in the south here. And this is why it's our cold front that's associated with that mid-latitude cyclone. Again, a cyclone is a low pressure system. It's where air is converging at the surface. It has nowhere to go but up. And at the top or aloft, we have divergence, because again, it hits the top of the troposphere, has nowhere to go but outward from there. And we've seen this um, in a previous chapter, but this is essentially what keeps these weather patterns going. We have winds coming in towards the low moving away from the high. Convergence at the surface around the low, divergence aloft. And then at the high, we have divergence at the surface and convergence aloft. And the jet stream are those upper atmosphere rivers of air that move these systems along. And that is it for 19.1 to 19.3.